Good morning and welcome everyone. I'm Margaret Mueller. I'm president and CEO of the Executives Club of Chicago. It's my pleasure to welcome you all today for our Exploring Chicago's Talent Pipeline program. Thank you for joining us bright and early on what is a gorgeous sunny day. Uh, I had to be neutral. I'm an alum of two of these schools and I was really struggling with what to wear. So I went with green. I figured that could not uh, show any allegiance to anyone. But if this is your first time at an event, thank you for being here. Uh, we'd love to welcome you to our community. If you ever are interested in learning about membership, we have staff all around the room that would be happy to talk to you about that. And before we get started, I also want to thank all of the companies who sponsor the club and make all of our programming possible. We are grateful to all of you. Many of you are here with us today. Thank you. And I also want to give a special thanks to our presenting sponsor for today's program, Kivit and our featured sponsor, Jelly Vision. And lastly, I'd like to give a big shout out to the board of directors, many of our, whom are in the room today. Thank you for all of you do and helping make the club what it is. I do encourage you to submit questions. I know Scott has a lot he's gonna get through, but he will keep an eye on them. And so you can text exec, E-X-E-C, to 22333, that's in your program, so you don't have to worry about memorizing it. And I think he'll try to get to them if he can. And now I'd like to welcome Jeannie Reedy, who's the general manager at Kivit, to introduce our panelists. Hi everyone, good morning. Um, my name is Jeannie Reedy, I'm the general manager of Kivit's Chicago office. Uh, Kivit is a proud, long-standing partner of uh, the Executives Club, and we're happy to be the presenting sponsor for today's program. Kivit is a strategic communications firm uh, built to help organizations meet their moment and navigate the most complex issues that they're facing. That includes communicating to their current and future workforce, uh, which is why we're so excited to be part of this program today. We work with Fortune 500 companies, uh, nonprofits, advocacy groups, and public agencies, but we also do a lot of work in higher education uh, to help identify and shape and amplify ideas uh, and issues to move critical audiences, um, which is what we're talking about here today. I have the honor of, in, of introducing our incredible panel of experts for the program today. Uh, joining us are Jeffrey Brown, Dean of the University of Illinois Geese College of Business, Francesca Cornelli, Dean of the Northwestern University School of Management, and Madhav Rajan, Dean of the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Our moderator today is Scott Swanson, President of Illinois, excuse me, President of Illinois at PNC Bank and Chairman of the Exec Club Board of Directors. They will be discussing emerging trends among business students and what those trends could mean for the future of our talent pipeline in Chicago. They'll also be touching on how these trends intersect with what businesses are looking for uh, from their current work workforce. So now I'd like to pass it over to Scott to get the conversation started. All right. Well, thank you. Wonderful to have you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wonderful to, uh, to have all of you here today in this beautiful room, a wonderful way to, uh, to show off uh, one of the iconic facilities within uh, our city and bring everyone together. Uh, we are so fortunate today to have the deans of three world-class institutions. It, it really highlights one of the great assets of, of Illinois and certainly the Chicagoland area is that we have such renowned universities, colleges and universities that, that really are a key driver for us in terms of the opportunity we have, certainly on building talent, on the way that they work with businesses. And, and, and one of the, the key objectives today is to ensure that we're finding ways to do that even more effectively. I do want to acknowledge a couple of other deans that are with us, uh, the deans of the Chicago Business Schools, uh, Su Lin Ba, who's the dean of the Driehaus School of Business at DePaul University, and uh, Sandy Wayne, the interim dean of the College of Business Administration at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Welcome. Yeah, so seeing a room filled with people uh, is, is still uh, a wonderful kind of fresh experience for many of us as, we, as we've kind of navigated through coming off the, the third anniversary about a month ago of, uh, of this global pandemic. And, uh, and one of the things that I, I always want to hear perspectives around uh, as we, those of us in the business community leading businesses and organizations are, are finding ways to operate in, in what, what is the new normal, whether it's uh, the return to office strategy, the hybrid environment, or, or really the increasing role of uh, remote workforce in, in many of uh, our industries. Uh, and so I want to open up just with a question for each of the deans uh, to highlight what the last few years 
has meant in terms of the way that they manage through their programs, the, the engagement of students, uh, and, uh, and, and that will really kind of set up a foundation for many of the things that we'll dig into today in terms of uh, really the talent being built through the program. So I'll open that up to each of you to, to start. Rajan. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Um, I think that we've been through the pandemic uh, dealing with the same issues that all of you have. Uh, dealing with uh, staff and issues about working from home and uh, how do you set that up. Uh, dealing with students on our end and uh, how to actually keep the academic mission going during a time of the pandemic when we couldn't actually meet in person. So for all of us, the in-person class was always the way that we delivered instruction, right, for over 100, 200 years. And that had to change within the space of like a week, right? Um, and if any of you know faculty, getting faculty to change things is not that easy. Uh, we had to get that done in like 10 days and get them to switch from in-person teaching to remote teaching. And I would say overall it worked well. Uh, the switching was, I think, uh, not that bad, and in many ways, I think in the long run was helpful in terms of getting our faculty to get used to different modalities of teaching. So we did remote teaching, we did hybrid teaching. Um, I think that, you know, I think one thing we certainly found out was that remote teaching is not the same as the in-person model in terms of the content that you can deliver, in terms of people's ability to absorb things. Um, but, but we did it because we had to, and then we've come out of it, and Going forward, I think it's an interesting question as to which modality we will end up in. I, and I think there are differences across programs in what we will do, and we can, we can chat about that. On the staff side, I think like all of you, we have gone to more of a hybrid model now, uh, like a three plus two or four plus one. Um, and we don't know where that's going to end up uh, eventually. It seems to be working okay at this point, I would say. On the plus side, uh, we did learn that we could use technology to do a lot more things more efficiently particularly in terms of alumni outreach and engagement than we did before. Uh, we used to do, for example, a speaker series, right? You'd bring in a distinguished speaker onto campus and we might do like one of them every quarter and set up a day for them to meet students. Uh, during COVID, we couldn't do that. We started doing online speaker series and that proved to be wildly popular. So those are things where we learned and we will continue to do them. So we do many more events. We do events targeted to different geographies, time zones. And that's been, I would say, a big positive that we have learned. So I think there are lessons as well from COVID that we're going to continue sort of going forward. So let me stop there. Francisca. Yes. So I was uh, dean five months into it uh, when it happened. So it was definitely a baptism of fire. I always say that uh, the, the good part was um, Kellogg always had a crisis management course as a part of the core. Actually, we had so many alumni emailing us saying, oh, this is so useful. And uh, so I, I, I took uh, all the faculty teaching crisis management and created my own crisis management cabinet. So I thought, you see, academics are very useful. You know, it, it is useful teaching. <laughs> so um, it, it was, uh, you know, a bit like Mada, we, we had the same type of issues. I felt, uh, you know, for me, it was only five months. It was a great moment to see the, the school come together. You know, we have this reputation of a school that's very cooperative with a special culture. And I could see it very much as a hands-on. Like, I asked faculty if they were, you know, the, the, the spring we were all in lockdown. But uh, in the summer, we had new courses coming in who was wanted to teach in person, 70% of our faculty uh, volunteer to teach in person. If you think in the th remaining 30%, there were people with uh, uh, medical reason or living with people with medical reason, I thought it was uh, outstanding and uh, it just gave me a sense. And, uh, and, and it was, uh, you know, and it was also a lot of working with the students. It was uh, really practicing all we, uh, we, we've been teaching trying to leave uh, our uh, reputation. So in that sense, it was a lot of learning and a lot of uh, interesting. And again, it's, it's also thinking about, about the future. Right? Because the, our faculty were so keen, were, were willing to teach in person, uh, we, we, we had a lot of the hybrid with part of the students in the class, 
plus on, on uh, Zoom and some faculty in, in, in person. So we've been experimenting, which is probably the most difficult way to teach. It's easier either everybody on Zoom or everybody in person. But I think that's probably going to be part of the future. So we experimented a lot in terms of sounds, cameras, a style, how do you get people. And I think there's a, maybe a future also for business school helping um, businesses in how do you conduct a hybrid meeting, right? How do you, how do you manage in a hybrid, a hybrid world? So we're still all seeing how, what's happening with the workforce, but I think it's, uh, we, we are kind of living it uh, through it and teaching. Well, good morning, everybody, and thanks for being here. So GEESE is a, um, a, a bit different in terms of our composition because we have a large undergraduate program as well as large graduate programs, and we have both in-person and online uh, programs. So we were in a fortunate position when the pandemic came along in two respects. One is that we had been in the online degree business through our MBA program since 2016, so we kind of had the infrastructure in place and, and the training and the knowledge of how to do it well that we were able to, to, to shift things over uh, where appropriate into online and do that relatively quickly. And then over that summer, we trained all of our faculty so they were all prepared for it. But the second way that we were really fortunate, and I'll give credit to campus leadership on this, is that many of you know Illinois developed that saliva-based COVID test and that allowed our students to be on campus, uh, our residential students. Um, at least those who could get there. We had a lot of international students that weren't able to get to the United States. But as a result, we were actually, I mean, we, a lot of our classes were running in person. Obviously, people were socially distanced and wearing masks and all of that. But the fact that students were going in and being tested every two to three days and faculty were being tested every two to three days, I actually felt like it was probably one of the safest places on earth to be. Uh, during that time, and so um, I'll give all the credit to the scientists and the folks who rolled it out, but that uh, was definitely a benefit for us. Uh, since then, I mean, similar uh, to both of you, and probably most of you in the room, uh, we are getting used to a world in which uh, people have expectations around remote work opportunities, hybrid work opportunities. Uh, we're trying to prepare students for that world, and so that's clearly, it's just another dimension along which firms and employers have to compete is, uh, you know, to what extent are you willing to be flexible in your work arrangements for, for folks? I think we have something like, I think most of our faculty are coming in and teaching in person, but our support staff, which is a really important part of the college, it's everything from the people who run our, our online studios and our labs and so forth, something like two thirds of them are working hybrid schedules. Uh, and that's clearly a big shift from, from prior. And, and uh, Dean Cornell, you mentioned, uh, uh, each of you did in, in one respect, just learning to manage within a hybrid environment. We find that to be, you know, very challenging at this moment. As you, many of us have businesses where we've got, uh, where we consider a part of our development an apprenticeship, and how do you engage, you in, in, in the balance between a, a team's call or in-person development, and, and you're kind of at the cutting edge of the front lines of, of really setting those expectations and developing our leaders of the future. So appreciate that. So let's pivot uh, a bit to dig into expectations that you are seeing now from graduates uh, in the programs. Uh, we're living in very complex times. We've got a, a combination of uh, changing economic environment. Uh, we, uh, we obviously uh, have different industries that have uh, evolved through the pandemic. You've got different disciplines that have become increasingly important or created greater opportunity. What, what, is the, uh, what are you hearing from your students, or how has that influenced, perhaps, the types of uh, academic programs your students have, uh, have really pushed to, to ensure that they are getting to, to be prepared in today's workforce in, uh, in this more complex time? Uh, Dean Cornell, do you want to start with that? So, um, as I was saying, one, one part has been like the, we have the course of crisis management as a core, and if you want, uh, so that remained the same, but maybe it was more appreciate why we have it in, uh, in as, as a compulsory, and uh, we have several courses. Our students are really leaning into the need of managing diverse team, how to be more inclusive, how to motivate people. So uh, we even, uh, there's a lot 
lot of demand for that. Uh, we have uh, traditionally a dispute resolution research center, which has been there you know, for 20 years. And uh, it's, it's really about conflict resolution, intercultural uh, uh, exchanges. So we've been leaning in on that. And uh, we created, for example, a DI uh, pathway, which is not only meant for people who are going in that type of jobs, but for everybody, because the recognition is that for leaders of today, you just really need much more of that component. So we have a lot of demand on that aspect, for example, and we've creating a lot of new courses, like we have one which is leading with empathy, how to you know mobilize diverse team. We have another one which is political debate for business leaders, which is actually much more focused on policies, but how to, uh, the, the students are encouraged to have, uh, you know, a, a debate, uh, a, res a rational debate about policies issues and how to do it and how to take a business point of view. There's a lot of demand for this type of courses, so we are trying to do that. And then there's a lot of demand for, uh, uh, you, you know, the tech, the AI, the transformation, what does it imply? Uh, for uh, for the world, right? We are, we are all trying to figure it out and the students see a lot of that. And it's, again, it's less, oh, I'm going to do into a tech job and therefore I want that type of courses. Of course, that's always been there. But it's more whatever job I, 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 I need, I, I need to figure it out, how to deal with all this data, how to deal with how the AI is changing the world. There's more of a consciousness that they need to understand that. And then finally, otherwise I'm going to take away all the topics from everybody else, is social impact, which is a very, very, this generation cares a lot about that. Sure, I mean, I agree with everything that uh, you said. And, and what I would add is, so we already mentioned that students are trying to figure out how to navigate in a remote and hybrid work environment. From a topic standpoint, I think the pandemic led them to do a lot of soul searching. So there's a lot of emphasis on purpose, a lot of emphasis on the mission of a company, um, how it aligns with their own values and so forth. So there's a big, I think, especially at the undergrad level, a big shift in that direction. And then finally, um, we're definitely seeing shifts and trends in what students are interested in from a subject matter standpoint. Um, we're seeing a pretty steady decline in the number of accounting majors, an increase in finance and technology oriented degrees and, and things like that. So it's, um, you know, I, on top of all that, I'll just say it's, it's, a, it's both a fascinating and a really challenging time to be a student. And what I mean is on the fascinating side, there's all this great new technology coming out and the economy is evolving quickly. And so the, the opportunities are amazing. And yet at the same time, they're looking around and there's like very few role models in the world of how to have a civil debate and civil discourse about policy issues and so forth. And I think they're having, a, frankly, a difficult time figuring out how to navigate that. So like Francesca said, I mean, we, one of my associate deans taught a course on civil discourse in a business school, right? I mean, that's not something that we would have done five or 10 years ago. Um, I'll add a couple of things. One, on the issue of students being interested in sort of impact and I, I think, you know, their place in society, I think that's, that's a huge issue. Um, so we had a course that we started a couple of years ago called Perspectives on Capitalism. Uh, thinking through, you know, what's, you know, ultimately, you know, you want to be in a capitalist society, but thinking through what are the pluses and minuses and how much you want to modify it. And that's become a huge success for us, probably one of the most popular classes we teach. And every week we have a different faculty member teaching it. Uh, so one week we have Luigi Zingales, right, or Raghu or Kevin Murphy. So you get very different perspectives on that. And so I think that is a huge uh, issue. Um, two other things I would say is that the interest in entrepreneurship has been growing. And uh, it's now the most popular, like, uh, concentration at uh, at Chicago, and uh, so Mark is here. You know, Mark uh, Tebby. So Mark uh, and Steve Kaplan have had a lot to do with that. Uh, and so students wanting to kind of do their own thing, um, think about entrepreneurship through acquisition. You know, buying their own company. That's become a big, I would say, uh, plus. Uh, the other area that's changed a lot is that uh, we send more students to tech companies than to finance now. And so the demand for courses that would make them a product manager in a big tech company, 
that's grown and that's become something a lot of our students want to do. Uh, so there are courses you can take at the business school, but more and more I've been pushing our students to take classes at other schools on campus to take advantage of that. So we have a joint degree with computer science that's become like wildly popular for that reason. And so you, you do uh, you know, your MBA at Booth, but then you can do a master's in CS at the same time. You work ridiculously hard, but uh, it's, uh, um, you know, fewer trips to Croatia maybe. But uh, at the end of the day, these students, I think, uh, end up with really great uh, opportunities. So that I see as a real future. Uh, well, there's a lot I'd actually like to uh, dig into that each of you shared. I, I, I will, I guess, uh, tap into entrepreneurship to start because uh, one of the things we all want to feel a bit empowered about coming out of this is is really the dynamics of Chicago and the labor market and and how we're attack, attracting and/or retaining talent. But what is the uh, what is the impact of this interest in entrepreneurship of of you know, graduates owning their own business and being in a bit, what, what kind of an impact do we see that having on the labor market, both in terms of going into more mature industries and or creating opportunities for growth? And, and how are your programs uh, really helping to prepare entrepreneurs uh, to, uh, to fulfill that? Um, perhaps Dean Cornelli or, or Dean Brown? Go ahead. Um, so we've actually been thinking a lot and redesigning our entrepreneurship from that point of view in the sense that there's a, a lot of people work on an idea in, uh, in business school, but actually what we see is, uh, you know, I don't always like to tell the student because it's if they find it a bit dispiriting, but the data is that most of the ventures they are working with on uh, during business school uh, actually end up failing. And actually the data is that we, we have a faculty doing research that the average age of a successful entrepreneur is actually 39, it's not that young. So the idea is they work on a venture, but you know it might not be that venture. So we're trying to focus very much on the individual and for when it's there. So there's a lot of them who maybe work on a venture, but then when they go on the on, on the market, they, they maybe get a consulting job and they say, well, I refine my idea. I mean, there is a core group of, of students, like we have the Zell program, which is really focused on people who want to do their venture and immediately after they will do it, whether it's entrepreneurship through acquisition or a startup. But then there's a lot of others who are thinking about it, it's still too early. And I think that is part of what it means for the job market. It's not only entrepreneurship, I think as life uh, expectancies becomes longer and longer, people are not thinking of only one career in their life. People are not just saying, I'm going to enter this industry and I'm going to stay there until retirement. So entrepreneurship is again part of a, you want portfolios of careers and people are thinking. So I think our focus has also been of how to prepare them. And that's also where the virtual be is like, can we be with you? at the moment later in your life when you will decide to make that switch to entrepreneurship. I'm just delighted to hear I still have time to be an entrepreneur. So, <laughs> um, like Illinois is definitely known for entrepreneurship and I give a lot of the credit to our, our um, colleagues across campus at engineering, but um, within the business school, we also really um, invest a lot in this and there are a lot of students that are interested in it. So we have undergraduate programs, we have an uh, iVenture accelerator that um, is competitive to get into. We support students, we give them lots of training, access to resources. Uh, there's a Technology Entrepreneurship Center at, at the Granger College of Engineering. So there's a lot happening. We have a major in the area. We just um, started some undergraduate certificates in the space. Uh, we we're rolling out a graduate certificate in the grad space. So there's definitely a lot of interest in it. The issue that is well known, and it's one of the reasons that um, the state invested in this Discovery Partners Institute down at the 78, um, is so many of the entrepreneurs get advice that in order to be successful, they need to be part of a rich entrepreneurial ecosystem and everybody tells them that means they you know, need to head to the West Coast or if they're in health sciences, they head up to Cambridge. Um, and we are working really hard and I know a lot of people are to figure out how can we keep more of that talent and more of those startups here in Chicago. 
and I know all of our universities are playing a role in that as well as a lot of civic organizations and so forth, but you know, there, there are some issues that still need to be overcome. Uh, there's just not the, the depth of venture capital in Chicago that you see in other places. We don't have the same level of sort of ecosystem where startups can be each other's customers and where you can trade talent and, and things like that. So it's a work in process. I'm optimistic about it but it's gonna to continue to take a lot of focus and a lot of care and feeding and the economic environment here needs to be um, conducive to that. So policy is going to matter. There's a, there's a lot of pieces and I, I think Chicago has an opportunity to really emerge as the entrepreneurship, you know, one of the great entrepreneurship hubs, but it is not a guarantee we're gonna get there. Well, and I do know the alumni organizations of all three of your institutions in Silicon Valley is, are a little too big, so we need to bring them back, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, Dean Rajan, do you want to elaborate more? Sure. Uh, just to, to build on that, I, I do agree. We have a lot of students who study entrepreneurship, but relatively few go into it right out of school, right? They, they end up taking jobs in consulting or other fields, which, as Francesca said, that might be the right thing to do at that stage. A uh, few years out, they get experience, and then they want to start their businesses. Um, but to those who do start right away, right, whether they do a new venture challenge at the college level or the MBA level, I think the funding is an issue to make sure that they do stay in this in, in this region and setting up you know incubators accelerators that help them to to stay I think is going to be important um, the university has been trying to do some of that we you know we started this new quantum uh, accelerator and part of the criteria to get into it is that you have to then agree to stay in Chicago and and that's been I think a successful model and uh, you know so I think policies ultimately will make a big difference in terms of how we develop this ecosystem and make it better for everybody. I'm gonna stay with you, Dean Rajan. On you'd, you had mentioned that you have more graduates going into tech. You know, you think historically for a lot of schools, certainly in Illinois, a lot, lot going into finance and accounting and, and consulting. Um, curious, just if you could elaborate more on the industries that you really see as the key drivers out of your placements programs. Uh, that students are going into, and whether or not there have been new industries that have emerged in this pandemic environment, in this post-pandemic environment? So I think for us, consulting still is by far the biggest industry that students go into. And last year, kind of at the, when we were just coming out of the pandemic, I think like 10% of the class went to McKinsey, right? Which you can argue is that a good thing or a bad thing, but you know, it is, it is what it is. Um, so I, I think if you look at consulting, that still takes about a third of our students. Uh, and like I said, they don't necessarily view that as where they want to be long term, but it's the sort of it's it's a great starting place out of an MBA to eventually get into a general management uh, sort of career. Uh, the tech part is interesting; that's grown over the last several years, and particularly to get into these product management type roles in tech, which honestly was a position that didn't even exist like 15 years ago, right? It's something basically Google created this notion of a product manager, but but it's a perfect role for somebody who has technical skills. Um, and has an MBA. And, and so we've sort of been leaning into that. Uh, our curriculum has always been very good at sort of, you know, dealing with data and, you know, discipline-based work. And it wasn't that hard for us to switch into putting in courses that would help students get those types of jobs, right? Courses on machine learning or AI or digital marketing or fields like that. The decline in finance really is more about the decline in students going into the traditional finance roles, right? Like banking. Um, and the people who go into finance increasingly want to go into like private equity or venture capital type roles. And so that's been, uh, that's seen a significant increase. But the broader decline in banking is why finance is sort of lower than, than tech, I would say. So we've had to do a lot to set up programs to help students break into VC or PE type roles. Uh, PE is sort of easier to figure out how to get people into that. Uh, VC a bit harder because it's tends to be a bit more clubby, um, but the big change we've made in the curriculum is to set up classes that are a lot more experiential, meaning you're taking a class at Booth, but then you're also doing an internship at the same time at an organization, whether it's a PE firm or a VC firm, and I think that's been a big change in helping these students break into those fields that otherwise were much harder to get into. Thank you. Uh, Dean Cornell, you had, you had mentioned uh, that uh, you know the average age of a, an entrepreneur perhaps is 39. We've talked about kind of the evolution or the the journey that people are on within their own careers. 
Um, you know, one of the things we have seen, and, and certainly many of you who run businesses and or, or manage teams are looking for uh, continued opportunities uh, for continuing education. So what are those opportunities outside of a structured MBA program or, or other formalized uh, teaching programs for, for continuing ed? I, actually, I, I think I will start with Dean Brown on this on, you know, have you seen an increased interest in certification programs and shorter term educational opportunities? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll try to be brief, but I'm pretty passionate about this topic. I think the whole higher education model is outdated. And what I mean by that is the concept of a degree where you go to school for four years, maybe you work a couple years and you go back for a year or two, and you think that's all the education you need. That, that model made sense six or 800 years ago when in, when in four or five years you could pretty much learn all the knowledge there was to learn in the world and be set for the rest of your life. And that's just not the case today. I mean, we have students graduating two years ago that are already feeling behind on some of the technology. You know, it, six months ago, nobody had ever heard of chat GPT, right? And, and so I think that what we need to be increasingly thinking about are models of work and education that are integrated with each other and that are lifelong. And we all talk about lifelong learning, but we haven't really formalized it yet. And so I think the key to that or the path to that is going to be um, you know, we have students that are getting work experience, working on experiential learning projects and so forth during their education. But then that kind of melding together of formal education and work experience just needs to continue. So we are in the process, I think we've launched six graduate certificates. We've got like four more coming along. Um, I may not have those numbers exactly right, that are like three, four credit courses that together gives you a transcriptable credential from the University of Illinois. Um, and for some people, that's going to be all they want. You know, they've reached a point in their career and they're like, you know, I never really had much finance as an undergrad and it's holding me back now and I want to go back and get that. We've done some other interesting things where you can then start with those credentials and then stack them into a degree so you don't have to repeat the credits if you decide you want to get a master's in management and then you decide you want to stack that into an MBA. So we're creating this whole set of like Lego building blocks that are really adaptable to what people need when they need it. And I think our whole higher ed industry of business education really needs to move more in that direction. Um, you know, we're, I'm, I'm sitting on a stage with two of the great providers of executive education historically. Um, and, and what I think a lot of firms now want to see is that kind of education happening to a, a broader and broader segment of their firms and their population. And some of that can be done online, some of it's gonna be done in the traditional uh, way. Uh, but I think that's clearly where the future is heading. Dean Cornelli? Yes. So, um, part is, so, there's the executive education, then there's the lifelong learning, right? You can think of uh, executive education as part of it. And part of the online, I mean, we had started before doing a lot of online executive education, even before COVID, and we expanded even more. And, uh, like, for example, we have three certificate project, product management, digital marketing, sales, and that is also a great way to reach out people abroad or anyway far away who wouldn't think in in person. And then we have certificate of people can combine classes. They have to take like four classes, like a family enterprise, different uh, certificates. So to me, it's interesting. on one side, I think the online has really reached out and helped people. On the other hand, however, I want to mention, when we look at custom executive education to companies, then the demand for in-person is unprecedented. We never had such high demand. And my interpretation is exactly as company have to struggle with the hybrid, with how to create a workforce and so on, they value even more bringing their workforce together, it could be a week, it could be three days, but maximize that exchange that doesn't necessarily happen, uh, you know, on the workforce. So it's interesting because on one side, you have the explosion of the online that allows us to reach a lot of people and offer certificate, and they are cheaper, frankly, than coming in person. But on the other side, there's this actually incredible value for the in-person. And just to add, I completely agree. We are also thinking about what is lifelong learning. And really, to me, lifelong learning is no, I'm going to, I mean, 
exec ed, you can see it is that. I take a course. But to me, the lifelong learning is really, can I come and, and, and have the update and have a change and have a, an additional uh, thing? So that's, that, that will be the revolutionary part of uh, continuing. Yeah, I, would, I would add to that that we, when our students graduate now, we tell them, we give them sort of three free classes they can do whenever they want to sort of come back. Um, and that's just one way of telling students, because we always tell them you're a student for two years, you're an alum for life. Uh, and in my view, you know, I don't want to keep going back to our alums and always asking them for money, although that's always nice if, if they're willing to do that. But I also want to give them something, and the something is the education, right? The MBA that they did 10 years ago is very different than the MBA that we're giving today. So ultimately, what do we have to give is content. And so finding ways to deliver that uh, at scale, which I think we've learned a lot how to do during the pandemic, I think that is the future, and that's what lifelong learning is. I almost feel we have an obligation to keep doing that uh, to our alumni, and then also use that to disseminate it sort of more broadly. So I do think that's the future. Uh, we haven't done uh, the shorter classes or certificates that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, the, the Jeff and Francesca had done, but I do think that is the future. Uh, I do think that going forward, uh, not everybody is going to take two years out to come and do a full-time MBA. So finding ways to uh, meet our mission by providing them the education that they want, I think we have to be there to give them what they're looking for. So I do think that's the future. All right. <laughs> Early on, you had each referenced kind of the, some of the, the priorities uh, that students had during, particularly during the pandemic around uh, ESG, DEI, um, just really uh, courses around on empathy. How, a, a, as you talk to uh, students in your programs today about the values or the culture of organizations that they're interested in potentially joining, what, what kind of role for all of us who are employers, particularly here in Chicago, what, what role does that play now as, as, a, uh, as a graduate kind of evolves the type or evaluates the type of company that he or she would like to be a part of, um, and how does your program kind of help to, to guide that? Perhaps Dean Raja? Sure. Uh, I think it's a much bigger issue than it used to be the case. I think 15 years ago, students, you know, sort of did an MBA, looked at the job board, and took the best job that they could. Uh, now they don't do that, right? They, they look at the organizations and try to figure out, is that a, an organization I want to be a part of? So it's very important them to understand the nature of the, pro, the business they're going to, the culture there, uh, and also to think about their progression. I think, you know, as Francesca said, students no longer are going to do one or two jobs in their life. They're going to do, you know, seven to ten. So they want to know, like, how quickly can I learn? How quickly can I move up? And so they want to have a very clear mapping about what is the future for me if I go into that organization or what skills am I going to get there that will help me uh, in, in other places. And social mission is very important to them, right? It's not just about uh, doing well, as they say, but doing good. So is this an organization that's doing the kinds of things that I believe in, that I'm proud to say I'm a part of? And so more and more when you're trying to attract these, uh, these high potential employees, you're trying to convince them that you, know, you are an institution that's doing the kinds of things that they want to be a part of, that they want to believe in the mission and to help you. And so the onus is really on the organization to show them that they can get that sort of growth uh, and also fulfill the other parts of their life that they're trying to get done. In Cornell? Yes. Well, it's very much the same. The students, uh, I mean, first of all, the, the social impact, the things, I mean, to me it's very interesting, like 74% of our students take at least one course in social impact, and 84%, sorry, 84% take one, and 74%, my, my percentages were not working very well, 74% take at least two. So. Um, and that, to me, is incredible, right? It's an incredible change, which means, again, it's not just for people who are thinking of one career. It's everybody's thinking whether it's a future career or on the side. I think one thing sometimes I hear from our young alumni is also, I, I think the businesses sometimes portray themselves like this, but then when they arrive, they have a shock, right? They come from a business school in which they learn all this, uh, leading with empathy and being inclusive and how to create a discourse, and then they arrive in an organization which is not necessarily, you, you know, it is an intention, but not. So I think sometimes businesses could also be more opening, 
okay, you're not perfect, but you can come and change. Because the students, I, I really think, again, they also love the idea to have an impact outside, but an impact in the organization. So you don't have to necessarily portray yourself as perfect, but rather as open to the impact and, 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 making, a, and, and making a difference. So, so that could be another thing. Completely agree. I'll just say two things. One is you really have to connect the dots for them of the work they're going to be doing and the bigger purpose that you're seeking to serve because they, they long for that. And true, it's got, or, or two, it's got to be authentic. They're, they're um, you know, look, these college student generations always get labeled in various ways, but they are very smart and they're very perceptive. And they can tell when your mission statement is just empty words on a page and you're not living it, right? So um, if, if your organization is one that has a strong culture that takes its broader mission or purpose seriously and people live it and breathe it and act in ways that are largely consistent with it, they will know that and that will be attractive to them. And when there's a disconnect, it's just words on a website, that's not gonna work. So that, that's, I would just amplify exactly what my colleagues have said. Yeah. Well, the Exec Club, we, we, uh, we have a number of programs throughout the year that do focus on, on talent, attracting talent, retaining talent, very specifically in the Chicagoland region. Uh, and so would, would love each of your perspectives uh, or updates on what you are seeing in terms of where your graduates are going. What, how, how is Chicago positioned? You've talked about some of the industries that are important and certainly where we've got gaps that, that has an impact. But... Uh, do, uh, do you see changes in the percentage of students who, who specifically want to stay in Chicago, find that opportunity here uh, versus other, other cities? So uh, maybe Dean Brown? Yeah, so as a kind of flagship public university, um, we still have very strong placement in Chicago land area. I think something like 75% of our undergrads stay in Illinois. That's not all in Chicago, but it is, is very strong. I actually think the percentage that take their first jobs in Chicago is a little bit higher than the percentage that come from Illinois, so we're probably a net importer of talent. Um, at the graduate level, it's a very different story. I mean, our, our, MBA, our MBA program is now online, and maybe 20 to 25% of our students are from Illinois. But we're not a traditional MBA program where people are coming to change careers. Our students are much older. Their average age is like 38. And so most of them are not looking to relocate. They're doing our online degree precisely because they're in a job or a career that they love and they want to advance. Um, so I, I would say, if anything, Chicago is still attracting really good talent. I think the, the vibrancy of the downtown as a, a place to live is still very attractive to undergrads that are coming out. And there's a lot of great companies here. Uh, and, um, you know, we, I'd say those that are going into finance and accounting, this is a very attractive place to be. I think where we probably see a little more outflow of talent is still in the tech space. Probably not surprising. Yeah, uh, Dean Rajan or Cornelli? Yeah, maybe. Um, so I think we do send more students to who take jobs in Chicago than anywhere else. I think that's that's been true always. Uh, you know, there are lots of roles here in consulting and uh, you know, marketing, consumer packaged goods, finance areas like that. So that's done really well. Uh, the change that we're seeing is that fewer students are going to the West Coast than used to be the case. Uh, New York has become much more desirable as a place for people to go to, particularly in the last couple of years. And I think a lot has to do with the fact that I think the companies there have done much more to bring people back into the workforce and active than certainly uh, companies on the West Coast. So our students are much happier, even if they're working in a tech firm, to do it remotely from New York than to, than to go to California. So that's been a big change that we have seen. And so I think creating more of a vi vibrancy in the area has a huge impact on the ability to attract and keep young people. Uh, I think the big attraction in Chicago is that real estate, for example, is you know it's much more affordable than going to either of the coasts. So I think taking advantage of that by creating more activity in the downtown area, getting students more excited about being here, I think would have a huge impact. Well, and Dean Cornelli, I'll have you elaborate, but also just, uh, how does that impact as we bring in uh, bring in graduates into our, our companies uh, the role of in office? I mean, do you see that are, is there really a more of a propensity for graduates to seek those opportunities where they're engaging with others, or is there still that balance on kind of hybrid or remote? 
I, I think they're still uh, looking at the hybrid, actually. The students uh, are. I'm actually always telling them, you were so mad when you were hybrid in teaching. Why should it be that you want uh, hybrid at work? But uh, there's still that. I think I'm hearing from more senior alumni that, however, it's starting, you, you know, it's starting to hit to them after two, three years in the job that sometimes they can progress less fast if they are on the hybrid. So I think maybe there's a, a bit more of consciousness. It depends very much on the, on, on the type of job, right? That's the big challenge is for the tech, because for the tech, they naturally think it also fits, uh, f f fits what, they're, what they're doing and the job. So uh, a lot of uh, our students get jobs in startup or tech, especially exactly on the West Coast. And, and they have sold their, uh, their headquarters. They don't have premises anymore by definition. So it's a, it's a little bit of a, of, of, a, of a mix. It depends very much on the work. I think there's still, pe people are still trying to figure it out. Uh, I mean, and, and, and for the young people, they don't have enough experience to say, you know, how much of a hybrid is good for them or not. And frankly, I think even for us, right, I, I, my tendency would be, well, it's better in person, but the truth is we haven't experimented enough in their career uh, to, to see it. I, I would say the people in Chicago, though, you know, exactly, it's, it tends to be more in person, and the more we encourage them in person, the more they would like to be in Chicago. So I would say, you know, one of the things is we could try, because sometimes the students come from outside of Chicago, even if they're in Illinois, but they come here, let's say for undergraduate, they do the campus experience, then they may agree to go to to New York to work, and then we try to get them back in a business school, and then maybe they think also New York, but I think that there is a space for some cooperation where the students come to undergrad and we're trying to encourage them immediately as staying for a job by already having maybe an admission in a business school, like, like a longer time, so they, interpret, they experience being here in the school, so on campus, and then working, and then come back. And I think that, you know, the more they stay here, the more they really appreciate the advantages of Chicago. So I think there is some space in uh, for uh, business schools uh, or universities, undergraduates in general, and business school for after, and, and, co and companies for trying to do something that really, in, you know, lengthen the time that people stay in Chicago, and then they will naturally want to stay longer. And I think that is a great opportunity, obviously, for everyone uh, running a business in the in the room or, or or managing teams is the ways that we work with our uh, renowned institutions on creating that connectivity earlier on and and finding ways. I know Dean Cornelli and I were talking about that earlier. Uh, I do actually have a tie to each of these universities. I, I got a degree at. Uh, uh, University of Illinois and at, at Booth, uh, but I, uh, I just recently had a daughter graduate from Northwestern undergrad, so I feel very much as if I have a financial investment in, uh, in Northwestern. And I'd mentioned, though, that even for her, most of her friends happened to be from out of town and how much they enjoyed actually seeing Chicago. They really didn't have a, uh, an appreciation for our city or the opportunity. And in fact, most of her friends who were out of state students uh, actually took jobs in Chicago, which was which was great, but something we want to continue to see out of our graduate programs and and beyond. Uh, we have had some questions from the audience. Certainly, keep those coming in. One of them is is tying back to uh, kind of the experiences through the pandemic and the role that um, your institutions provide in terms of support uh, or ongoing support. I guess as it highlighted in an. Uh, in an increasingly volatile world around mental health and the, the wellness of your, your student bodies. Um, so perhaps you could highlight what role that now plays in your institutions to really create um, a, you know, a safe, supportive environment. Dean Rajan? I think this has been a huge uh, issue, uh, particularly, uh, I think, for specific popular student populations. I think it's a big issue with undergraduates. Uh, and also with uh, PhD students, right, who tend to be relatively, you know, more foreign students, uh, more isolated. And we've seen that providing support for wellness has been one of the biggest investments that we have made and that we have sort of had to make. Uh, every year, our MBA students will come together and do like a class gift. And a couple of years ago, the class gift that they gave was for us to invest more in uh, wellness. So, you know, setting up a wellness room, hiring somebody whose role is to make sure that students are supported, 
in terms of mental health while they're in the program. Uh, I think this is a huge issue and one that I think we will continue to do uh, a lot of big investments in going forward. Uh, so also for us, right? I mean, mental health or demand for mental health or wellness has really exploded. And I'm hearing also Northwestern undergraduates. So it's, it's, it's every, every university is. Uh, one of the things we have done in conjunction with the students, uh, we set up a protocol for any possible crisis, uh, you know, that bring stress in uh, providing safe spaces and, uh, uh, you know, people facilitate facilitating a dialogue or solution of crisis. I, because I think one of the other thing is what we realize is we couldn't, the crisis happened and then, okay, let's figure it out a way and we do one way or another. So the, stu the students really found a, ro a lot of comfort in the fact that we have a very well explicitly set up process for solving a crisis from small for to big, right, that would affect a subset of the students or all the students. But it's well set up, was discussed with them, was accepted by everybody, and now they know. So at least there's not the discussion of how do we solve this uh, aggravates the debate. So we've, uh, this is the first year we have it full in place and uh, we've been already using it and, uh, and it has facilitated. The, especially the exchange and the, the need for people for safe spaces to discuss how, the, how they feel. Yeah, it's a huge issue. I mean, I, one psychologist explained it as, we, as, a, as a world, we all went through a collective trauma and it disrupted the networks we have in the, in, in the day to days of our lives and so forth. And if you think about like at our undergraduate level, um, We've got students that were hit at really important parts of their lives when the pandemic came along, right? It was, for some of them, it was their freshman year in college got disrupted. For some of them, they missed their high school graduation and had to start college online. I mean, it was, um, it, it, it was not only disruptive, but it, 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 it interfered with the development of some of the just basic skills of, of social skills and networking with friends and family and so forth. So we're investing a lot in it. We have an embedded counselor as part of our undergraduate team. So they're part of the university counseling services, but they have their office in our business building. Um, makes it easy for students to come in. I mean, the good news about all this is that there's not the stigma with this kind of stuff that there was, you know, like when I was growing up. So, but, but to the extent that there's any, we make it easy. They can go in, it's the same advising office to get career advising or academic advising, and they can go and see someone. We also do a lot of programming, and it was just a week or two ago, uh, Rob Metzger's here from William Blair, Rob Brown from uh, Lincoln International. They were down on campus, and we had a session about you know, handling stress and mental health in the workplace that was targeted, especially at those going into finance fields and so forth. So it's a, it's a major issue, but it's one that every university leader that I know is taking very seriously and putting a lot of resources into. Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> Another question that has come up is, is what, what new technology or strategies have you implemented since the pandemic to support students in their job search? And what role can we, all of us who are, who are running businesses or recruiting, kind of engage with that to ensure that we are creating the best opportunity for the pipeline of talent? Maybe Dean Brown? Yeah, so it, it took a little while, but we're, we're largely, um, what, what we've added, we're back to lots of companies coming to campus to recruit. That had stopped for a period of time, and they'd all shifted to online, especially for the first round screening interviews. Some companies have stuck with that model. Some are back. Some are doing both. And I actually think it's a good thing that there, there's now this mix of modalities for doing that interviewing because, look, showing up for a physically present interview creates its own stress on students. It, it can advantage or disadvantage certain types of students and so forth. Some firms aren't going back. You know, they, they've decided that the first round of interviewing, they can talk to a much more diverse population of students from more schools and so forth. But, um, you know, on net, I think it's a, a positive. The, the challenge for us is we now have, like our career services office, now has to prepare students, not only for, you know, in the old days, like when I was looking for a job, you. They told you how to dress and what to show up and what to carry. Well, now we have to talk to them about what's in their Zoom background and how quiet the environment's going to be and to keep the pets out of the room, right? So it's, um, it, it's added to the richness of, of what we need to work with the students on. 
We, we uh, experience a bit of the same. Actually, the, the tendency to less in campus and more uh, coming with the virtual interview had started before COVID. Of course, the COVID it became all, but uh, there's a general tendency. And I think it actually allows smaller employers to come, right? So there's, there's more people, they go to more schools, but in a way, it actually increases the options for students, which comes as value, however, with the fact that all of a sudden, then they're not necessarily prepared for all these different type of employers. But, so that's something that we are navigating. But it's allowing the students to pursue things which are not traditional, a traditional business school destination. And we, at the beginning, would have, you know, years ago, we wouldn't have been equipped to even where to send them. And now people like, can do it. And we have always alumni who say, well, we would like to hire. Like, well, you can post it, you can do the interview. So that it, it does increase the, the options. Yeah, I agree. I think, I think um, it, it opens up the set of companies that can employ because you don't have the fixed cost of flying in and out. I, I would say that, you know, even though we have a lot of students who take sort of traditional jobs, if you will, in consulting, a big chunk want to do very sort of bespoke types of roles. And I think our career services spend most of the time with them. Uh, and, you know, they want to do private equity in Denver with a TMT company, right? Something like that. And, of course, then they're unhappy that career services can't help them enough. So, um, I, I think finding a way to make those matches well would be really uh, productive. Uh, so. Yeah, thank you. Well, one last question for each of you. Perhaps just a, a final, final remark or some insights that you'd like to share with the audience as we are all uh, grappling with how to maximize our opportunities to, to draw talent made, uh, and, and realize talent within our corporations and, uh, and to retain talent out of our, our, our fine institutions here. So perhaps some final remark, Dean Rajan? So the one thing I would say is that uh, one of the big advantages this, this area has is the sheer like, number and caliber of the educational institutions. And I think taking advantage of that and maximizing it is going to be huge. And I think a lot of it can be done through collaboration, right? I mean, you all know we, the, the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub is going to be set up here, and that's because it's a collaboration between literally the three institutions, right? Between uh, UIUC, Northwestern, and University of Chicago. And I think that's a very, very powerful direction for the future. Uh, we do uh, the College New Venture Challenge at Chicago, but that includes undergraduate students in engineering from the University of Illinois. So I think the more we can do together to collaborate, to invest in this region and the ecosystem in this region, I think the better for everybody. Thank you. Dean Cornelli? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, sometimes I do feel that instead of selling Kellogg, I have to sell Chicago versus someone who wants to go on the East Coast and the West Coast. And having, uh, ha having a cooperation will make it really, like an obvious choice for some people when playing on uh, each other's strength. Another thing I would like to mention, it is really unique of Chicago, not only uh, it's, it's like the... For, for example, um, in, in the case of business school, we don't only have the full-time, we have the part-time, which is evening and the weekend, we have the EMBA, and we have exec ed. Very few business schools have actually so many programs, with the exception of Booth. It's a very funny, because sometimes I'm like, okay, where's my, my competition in that, in the entire U.S.? Booth, where is the other? In the entire U.S. Booth. So like, really around the corner? That that's all. That's all. It's, it's, But it, but if you see it from the point of view of of Chicago, right? And then the undergraduate and the online, it's it's, it's actually it's more than having uh, top schools. It's top schools with a really large range. Of, of a program that fit a different needs, a different profile, different uh, seniority. And therefore, when it's like the retention, people have more options. And we should actually talk more about that. Thank you. Dean Brown. I'll just underscore everything that was just said. Look, this, this city is enormously fortunate to have so many great universities around us. I mean, there's five business school deans here today. Um, and uh, it's not just the business schools. We have amazing engineering schools and arts and all of that stuff. And not many states can boast that, right? And um, so the, the more that we can do as employers and universities together, the more that we, the universities can do together, the more that the city and the state can do to support higher education in the state and so forth, the better off we're going to be. I'm a true believer in the power of 
education and the power of research and the power of innovation. And I think the universities are one of the greatest comparative advantages that this country have had. I think it's, you know, it's one of those like top five things on my list of why the United States sort of, you know, dominated the world economy and, and, and so forth over the last century. And, um, but we can't take that for granted. We need to make investments in our higher ed system, public and private, in order to maintain that. And I think if we do that, the future for Chicago could be very bright, but we cannot take it for granted. Yeah, no, thank you. And certainly a well-educated and talent workforce is critical for Chicago to continue to be a global and competitive city. Uh, I want to thank Dean Rajan, Dean Cornelli, and Dean Brown. Let's give them a round of applause. We really are so fortunate uh, to have so many wonderful uh, colleges and universities here, and, and hopefully everyone has gained some insights on uh, on the trends that we're seeing, ways that in all of our businesses we can attract and retain uh, talent that's so vital to our futures. Uh, I, I do encourage all of you who are here today, perhaps for the first time in an executive club program, to check our website for future programs to, to create these kinds of opportunities, both to network and connect with uh, our fellow uh, colleagues in the business community, but also uh, for great insights like, like we've enjoyed this morning. Really, really appreciate you all being here. I have been sent a note. Uh, Chicago was just chosen to host the 2024 Democratic National Convention. So that uh, some big news. That will draw a lot, uh, lot, of, lot of activity in our city. I think we've got a lot going on. But, uh, but really, thank all of you for being here today. Again, thank you to the deans. Uh, have a great day. Thanks. <laughs>